eternal home with stories untold, adventures so grand. Together we journey through space's expanse. Join the fleet where dreams take flight in the darkness of space. We find our light. Hi guys, so this is a little bit of a different episode. This is an episode from the vault that we have with just audio episodes that we did pre moving to YouTube, anything like that. Um, unfortunately, my co-host this week is unwell, so we've had to do a little bit of a change, which isn't a bad thing. Um, so enjoy this episode about the alternate universes of Star Trek. Welcome listeners to Fleetcast, the ultimate destination for all things Obsidian Fleet related in the vast expanse of space. In this set of episodes, we'll be focusing on alternative universes. Imagine a world where everything you thought you knew could be turned on its head, where heroes become villains and the most unlikely alliances are forged. Whether it's a familiar story, retold with a twist, or an entirely original creation, alternative universes have allowed creators to push the boundaries of storytelling, transporting us to extraordinary realms beyond our wildest dreams. We'll discuss the iconic examples from the Grand Bacon, Mirror Universe and Star Trek to the mind-bending, upside down in Stranger Things that have appeared over the last couple of years. But we won't stop there. We'll explore lesser known gems like the multiverse of Neil Gaiman's Sandman or the dystopian parallel earth of Philip K. Dick's works. We will examine the themes, characters and plot lines that make these alternative universes so compelling. We'll consider the ethical questions raised by these narratives and ponder the tantalising what-ifs that arise when reality takes a detour. As you can tell, we're already big fans of all things multiverse. This episode is going to focus fully on Star Trek, with the next focusing on other media. I'm your host, and today I have a special guest with me. Let's welcome Andy, who joined us previously on the Power Ranger 30th episode. Thank you. Hello, all. Uh... Good evening if it's evening, good morning if it's morning, good afternoon, and let's hope you have fun listening to us. Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I've been in stimming and role-playing for about 20-odd years across multiple genres. Trek, Star Wars, Marvel, Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, you name it. It's a good set. Oh, yeah. So let's get into it. What's your least favorite out of the list that you created? For me, um, lowest ranked one here is probably the Shatnerverse. Mm -hmm. It's a series of 10 novels, three trilogies, and sort of a capstone. And technically, you could even call it 11 because of the novel Federation. It's one of the things that set apart from the novel verse that existed at the time, the sort of relaunch novels, because honestly, it came about when Bill Shatner said, I don't like the way that Captain Kirk died in Generations. Okay. So he reached out to two of the most prolific Star Trek authors, Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens, mm -hmm. and said, let's fix that. Yeah. So between his stories and some writing that he contributed, and the wonderful work from the Reeve Stevenses. They created a story that goes from Kirk being resurrected on um, the planet at the end of Generations. I can never remember it. I can never remember the name either, so don't worry. <laughs> you know, it goes from him being resurrected there to uh, having another son with a woman to having literally come face to face with Emperor Tiberius. Okay. Uh, Mirror Universe Romulans facing down Sela, all sorts of others. And it's this wonderful series of an adventure novel. That's really interesting. I didn't know this was actually a thing until we started discussing it a few weeks ago. And you were saying like Shatnerverse. And I was like, no, no, that's not a thing. No, I've actually looked into it. And some of the stories are absolutely amazing. Oh, absolutely. I, I I highly encourage anyone to go read them. They're really actually quite fun. They look like they're fun. What's your favorite story out of it? Oh, um, honestly, it's not even a, a whole story. It's one moment. 
where they've gone onto the Enterprise D and um, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Scotty are all there. Oh. And it's so well written. The moment that these four men, after all of the trials, all the tribulations, all of being separated for so long, they finally meet again and get a chance to come together. And there's, it's very well written and it's very powerful. And they're just, it, it was a, a heartwarming moment for me of seeing, you know, those four together. Yeah. Um, I mean, th- of course, immediately after, because Data has finally gotten his emotion chip by that point, um, he is assigned to uh, take Dr. McCoy back and forth again, just like in Farpoint. Yeah. And actually makes a joke about being the only android to have met the real McCoy. Which... (laughs) That's so awful. That's an awful joke. It is, and yet it's so great because it's Data, and because McCoy looks up at him, having remembered he's an android, he's worth, he's a little better than a Vulcan, right? Yeah. To hear him make a joke Mm -hmm. was, again, it was another one of those powerful character moments that, honestly, that the Reeves Stevenses are great at. Um, Absolutely suggest anything they wrote. If if you like Star Trek novels, if you like sci-fi, go read them. (laughs) It sounds like it's a novel, it's a set of novels that tackles lots of different issues, tackles lots of different things about, you know, it's it's tackling its own universes, of its own alternate universes inside a novel, even though it's an alternate universe of itself, it's then tackling other ones. You said like they've done mirror universes and, and seller and things like that. It sounds quite a complicated story to kind of latch on to with, with the different with the different parts is it quite an easy read or is it to me yes it's it, it is an easy read especially if you start at the beginning but that's yeah. the thing do not it, don't try to jump into it in like the second or third trilogy without having read the first ones because in a lot of ways it starts directly from the movie from generation yeah. in fact the first scene in the books is Spock going to again the planet I cannot remember the name of <laughs> to Kirk's grave on that world. Yeah. And paying his respect. So it starts from a very familiar place and then it just blooms. Yeah. Listen, it's it's interesting that Shatner decided that he, he didn't like his death and that he he created his own universe that kind of speaks to the ego of the man, I would say. A, a little bit. A little yeah. bit. It, it does. Um, yeah. I mean, though, he wasn't the only one who didn't like it, obviously. Yeah. Um, plus, he had had experience writing novels before mm-hmm. and working with other writers for the Tech War series. Yeah. So that's, you know, it, it does sort of speak to his ego, but it's also that he was already accustomed to write the, writing the story and not just doing it, you know, yeah. in his own head. Yeah. Well, definitely might be one that I might have a look out because I'm a fan of um, AUs, so we'll see. So that's what's that's the it. next one on the list? Oh, the next one, if we're just going down my list. Yeah, okay, we're we'll just going down is another set of novels. This one's actually six novels um, that are stemmy canon to the to the novel verse. Right. Table. Um, If you've ever heard of Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, or uh, Tales from the Floating Vagabond, or even um, a concept. 
that I think came from a couple of different fantasy stories, the in between worlds. Yeah. That's kind of what the captain's table is. It's a bar that exists everywhere and nowhere. The bartender's name is Cap. It can appear at any time period. You can be anywhere. Okay? And the the only way you can get in is by being a captain. Okay. Um, it starts, you know, it starts with um, Kirk and Sulu when Sulu's getting the Excelsior. Okay. And Sulu is very nervous about becoming a captain and, and what he's had to do as a captain. And Kirk takes him in. Okay. From Starbase. And instead of paying for drinks, the payment is in stories. So oh, they I tell an early that. Yep. And they tell an early story of something that happened on the Enterprise. And the next book, uh Jonian's Horde is Picard going in and telling one of his stories. The Mist is the one that I barely remember. Uh, that's the Cisco one, isn't it? The DS9. Yeah, that's the DS9 one, obviously, I, which is the one I would forget, the DS9 one. Um, <laughs> where he goes in and tells one of his stories, having seen the bar on Deep Space Nine. Okay. Instead of going to parks, he goes into the captain's table. Okay. Fireship. Jane Way sees the, the bar in the Delta Quadrant. Um and tells one of her early stories in yeah. command. Once burned is actually probably the most interesting one. And the one that I skipped the first time I read it, because I hadn't read Peter David's New Frontier. Oh, you've time. got to! It's one of my it's one of my favorite series. It's so good. Well, there's an AU for you, right? <laughs> that is, I love it. Yep, but New Frontier I hadn't read it at the time, and I, I've read the first one. I need to come around and read them again because they are good stories. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he writes one of, um, he, he actually wrote about, um, Calhoun's, uh, childhood. Ah, in, that would be good. In, in, um, Once Burned. Yeah. It, it's literally about what caused, uh, Calhoun to leave his home world and, you know, some of the stuff that led him yeah. to becoming the Starfleet captain that he was. And then my favorite, one of the first six, Where Sea Meets Sky. Captain Pike is still young. He has not been burned yet. He hasn't gone to the Academy, but he has just lost the Enterprise. Oh. He is walking along the wharf in San Francisco. And sees an old wooden door with a brass handle and a hand carved thing that says the captain's table. No. And he goes in and tells one of the stories of his enterprise. And there are hints throughout with the metafiction that all of these stories are happening the same night in the bar. I love that. Um, because the lizard that comes in with Kirk and Sulu, it, I mean, this is a bit of a spoiler, but I don't think anybody really cares about a lizard. Well, they do, but I don't think anybody's going to be upset at me for telling you about the lizard. Uh, the lizard that comes in with Kirk and Sulu from Starbase leaves with Captain Pike. Oh. Um, it's a great sort of metafiction because 
while they don't have, you know, the first six don't have anybody who's not a Federation captain. Yeah. There are Starfleet captains. There are Klingon captains. There's a Romulan. Oh. There's um, a Cation. And in fact, there's hints that the Merak even show up. Or uh, Xinti. Okay. All right. And other sort of science fiction characters. So if uh, you're a captain, you, you've got a table to go through there. Exactly. If you're a captain, go to the captain's table. That's cool. um, I love. And it's, it's a place where when you're feeling great, go in to tell one of the stories that or hear one of the stories of what makes it wonderful. When you're feeling down, tell a story and realize that you're not alone in being a captain. Yeah. That's, that's what it's about. It's the, the sort of brotherhood, the, the fact that so often, both in real life and in fiction, a captain is isolated. Yes. At the captain's table, they're not because everyone there is a captain. Yeah, it's a it's a place to share the load. Exactly, and um, yeah, it, it's also it's one of the best series for me because it was one of the ones where not only sort of was Pike just acknowledged as having been a captain of the Enterprise, the story that he tells is kind of a uniquely Pike story. Mm. Um, bef- you know, I haven't seen Strange New Worlds. I don't really have much of an interest. But that could have been an episode. But Where Sea Meets Sky could be an episode from that show or from yeah. the original pitch of Star Trek. It sounds like it could have been. Yeah. Um. And then after that, they did an anthology of short stories, um, because this was when they were doing the e-novels, around the time they were doing the SCE and stuff like that. So they did a Tales from the Captain's Table. Um, The canon ones from the show that had stories, uh, Archer um, came in, I think it was when they visited one of the alien uh, space stations, not on right. Earth, if memory serves, right. uh, Riker comes in from the Titan. Kira comes in from the DS9 relaunch. Chakotay comes in from the Voyager relaunch, because he had been a captain from before that. Yes. Uh, Liz Shelby gets a novel seriously if if for anyone who likes shelby you need to find the new frontier novels they are yeah. epic for developing her yes and that's that's exactly what it is that she comes in because she had been part of that and i believe it was written by peter david oh i hope so and then there's another one from demora sulu based on her lost years oh book. good um, I think the only one that really didn't get mentioned was one character who needed it, but they hadn't written The Lost Years yet. They were working on it. Um, so Garrett didn't get her own. Okay. Um, that makes yeah. that makes sense for the timing that it yeah. would be, you know. Exactly. Um for me, the next one's one that I think everybody loves. Voyager, Year of Hell. Mm-hmm. It's one of the best set of episodes in the whole of Voyager. And I'm going to say it now. The only disappointment I have with it is it wasn't longer. It should have been longer. They could have done so much more with it. Honestly, I I agree with you, and yet at the same time, I've come to understand the wisdom of not doing it. Yes. it was originally going to be that whole season. Yes, 
But what they did by cutting it down to a two-parter is they cut out all the filler. They cut out all the cruff. Yeah. And cut it down to the important moments. Yeah. And you know, I, I have learned over time that the point at which something is complete when you're done editing it is not when nothing more can be added, but when nothing can be taken away. Yeah. Yes. And that's what we got with Year of Hell. Yes. There is no moment in Year of Hell that can be taken away. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's such a harrowing glimpse into the, cru the crew's struggles and the devastating consequences they face throughout their journey in the Delta Quadrant. It's actually one of the episodes that inspired the Atlantis and, you know, us doing an end era lost in space ship because yeah. the year of hell, we wanted to explore something similar. You know, I just, I can remember watching it when it first came out and I can just be, you know, it's the fourth season. So we, we thought, you know, we were used to seeing the struggles and we'd never met a, such a ruthless, powerful enemy as the Crin. Is it the Crinem? Crinem Emporium? Yep. Yep. You know, we'd never met someone as as kind of dark as them. You know, yep. he's wielding a temporal weapon that's capable of altering history and erasing entire civilizations. It's just thinking back to like. 10 year old me and the fact she was watching it and she was devastated <laughs> this was happening it was just I yeah. don't think I don't actually think Trek has done an episode quite on that level since I, I completely agree with you um, it's some of the best adventure Star Trek that was ever written it's just you know, the temporal weapon is the ship is relentlessly attacking Voyager, causing damage after damage. You know, leaving the crew in a constant state of you know vulnerability. You know, the resources are dwindling, casualties are mounting. The crew is so close to not being able to survive. It's it's crazy. And the fact that the crew literally fractures. Yeah. Where you know you've got Chakotay who who goes over there, Tom, who goes over there. You know, the, basically, the Maquis and, and some of the others just disappear. Yeah. And at the end, Janeway's left with Torres and Seven and, you know, and, and a few loyal people. Like, yeah, you know, she's got Torres, she's got Seven, she's got Harry. Uh, Tuvok's gone blind. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole thing, the, the, the year of hell is absolutely some of the best track and it's one of the best sort of alternate universes yes. of track. Yes. Um, another one that is not actually an alternate universe, but sort of an alternate take, um, also from Voyager, Silver Blood, uh, <gasps> Kind of hits the same notes to me. The one with the aliens, where the aliens think they're yep. the crew. Exactly. Yes, yes. The one where the crew starts to fall apart and so on. Yeah, and the yes. ship starts to fall apart. But Voyager did those type of stories so well because oh, of the, because of where they are. You know, they're not in the usual Star Trek universe. I don't want to say universe, but they're not in the Federation. You know, right. they don't have that comfort of maybe helps come in they are that lost in space and it allowed them to tell so many good stories with that gut-wrenching feeling that you just you didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. i found that trek before voyager became very repetitive you know you could you could kind of guess what was going to happen and you knew that things were always going to be okay yep but then you had voyager and obviously you had ds9 and voyager kind of going for a couple of seasons at the same time, didn't we? Yep. Yeah. So I kind of feel that DS9 this last couple of seasons with the Dominion War, that kind of is the same kind of feel as Voyager. You know, it's very dark. You know, you've not seen the Federation at um war, you know, you've got the year of hell 
you know, these type of stories. And oh, I just think back on just the gut wrencher feel of, oh my God, are they going to escape this, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with, with Year of Hell also, it's it's not just what um, the Krenum did. It's that's it, the reason why it's so powerful as an alternate universe is that even as things are changing, even as the timeline is changing, even as everything is going wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Even as the characters change and, and, and some of them leave Voyager, they're still the same characters. Yeah. Chakotay fundamentally wants to find the change that will make everything better. Yeah. Tom wants to help him and wants to fly. Yeah. Janeway wants to get her crew home. Torres is there and wants to do and wants to prove herself. Yeah. So and do you know something? That's what I like. Sorry. That's what I liked about this episode. It gave Torres that opportunity. She did not leave with the rest of the mm -hmm. She stayed on that ship. Yeah, because Voyager was her home. Yeah. And it was the and first place where she was trusted and respected. And yes. between that one and, and the moment where she and Tom almost died in, in the oh, EV suits. And she finally, that's one of my favorite episodes. I love you. You know, it's absolutely one of the most powerful things. Yeah. That end of the day, give this character the chance to prove herself. Yes. And not only will she do so, she'll do it with style. Yeah. And, you know, okay, so she had anger issues. So many of us did in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing about Year of Hell and, and about Voyager as a whole, but Year of Hell specifically for me. As someone who is on the upper edge of the spectrum mm -hmm. and who has some social issues and some kind of emotional things going on sometimes. Seeing how they adapt yeah. against an impossible situation, impossible odds, everything going wrong, seeing the coping mechanisms played out on screen informed some of my coping mechanisms for years to come. Yeah. You know, the emotional toll of that episode was just, it was high. You know, the constant struggle was, you know, it weighed heavily on the characters. And I always felt that it, it kind of highlighted the human aspect of their journey. You know, it wasn't just about the ship. It was about, it was about them. Um, definitely, definitely one of the best alternate universes that I think Star Trek has done. It's, it's definitely up there. It's one of the darker ones, I think. It, it is. It absolutely is. Um... And also, for me, uh, I have to admit, there's one other thing about it um, at the time. Kind of in sort of a meta sense. Um, I, I had a clue from the beginning that the Krenim were going to be ridiculously cruel and so on. Mm -hmm. Because of who the captain was. Oh, yeah, it was it was um, Kurtwood Smith, who had played uh, Clarence Boddicker in the original RoboCop movie. Ah, uh, I didn't pick that up, and I still haven't picked that up thirty years later. But yeah, no, it's, it's Kurtwood Smith who played Boddicker. And Kurt would, yeah. and and who had also played in Star Trek VI, um, the president of the Federation. Uh, didn't it and, didn't click on that at all? Yep, and also played um, 
the father in that 70s show. Oh, yes. That's so, that's where I recognize him from more than anything because I love that show. Okay. I was not a huge fan of that 70s show. I didn't particu particularly like the humor in it originally. <laughs> um, some of it has grown on me. Yeah. But yeah, but, I, yeah. definitely. He's that type of actor needs. Yeah, you're correct. Looking back now, that type of actor definitely needed a deserved a strong episode to show off. Yeah. Absolutely. And he was a great villain because, you know, because he was, because he is such a great actor mm -hmm. and because he is such a powerful character actor, he, he made a great villain. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he had done so in RoboCop. He did so in Year of Hell. And I'm sure he's done it in many other things as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, while he was sort of a nothing character as the president of the Federation, he was still there and, and was still memorable. You know, it's not a blink and you'll miss it sort of moment. It is that you recognize, yes, this person is the one in charge here. Yeah. Sort of thing. Very much. So that, I... It's it, definitely it, a good AU. Yeah. Both of us are just both of us are just sat here and just thinking, yeah, it's 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 a good one. Oh yeah, we're we're both absolutely gushing and it's <laughs> absolutely appropriate. Very much. I just I think the storyline even now resonates with fans and it's just a powerful example of how great storytelling can be in the Star Trek universe if it's done oh, yeah. right. Oh yeah, if you if you love Star Trek if you even like Star Trek and you haven't seen The Year of Hell, go see it. Um, if you think that the height of Voyager is threshold with the space salamanders, go watch <laughs> The Year of Hell. Go watch Silver Blood. Yeah, it, it would definitely raise, it raise, it raise their standards. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, should we move on to the next one? Oh, yes. This is the big one for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this one is the Starfleet Universe. I don't know if you did any research from... I did. I did I did a little bit. I didn't do much, okay. but I did a little bit because I, I felt I would like to give you the option because you were so passionate about it when we were discussing yeah. it. I was going to let you lead the way because I've got other ones that I'm passionate about. Okay, so in the, in, I think it was 68 or 69, somewhere in there, CBS and Roddenberry worked with a company called Franz Joseph Designs to create the original Star Trek technical manual, the black covered book with the uh, ring binder yep. pages that laid out all of the details about how the Star Trek ships work, how the engineering systems were laid out, how the phasers work, gave you literal sewing machine instructions to make your own Starfleet uniform. Every technical detail was presented in-universe as information received during tomorrow was yesterday. Right. Okay. Now, because of that licensing, and because of the way it was used in the motion picture, mm -hmm. Franz Joseph Designs was able to sub-license all of their designs to anybody they wanted to. And because of the fact that they had the license in completeness at the time, that also included the animated series. So you'll see references to that as well. Okay. The one that stands out was to a company called Amarillo Design Bureau. They had designed three or four strategy games, uh, similar to like Osprey or some of the other companies 
they developed tabletop strategy games. Uh, World okay. War II, uh, fantasy ones, etc. In fact, yeah. um, Starfleet Battles was their fourth game and was their first mega hit. Yeah. Um, they use the designs and they used sort of general feel from the movie and from other things to create honestly a somewhat more aggressive version of the Starfleet un- of Trek. Yeah. Um, creating the Starfleet universe almost immediately. They were the first ones to really call out pieces of the universe or, or the galaxy. And instead of using quadrants, they used octum. Right. And it takes place in what's called the Lost Era. Um, we mentioned them, the, the novels in that time period then. It, it takes place during the movie era or in the five in the years between um TOS, the movie era. And then after the movie era into next generation, yeah, that that period. Um, in fact, frankly, discussions from CBS and memos that came out, uh, part of the reason why Roddenberry moved the next generation up so far into the timeline was because of Starfleet battles at the time. And Simon and Schuster, because Simon and Schuster then licensed part of it back for other things. Um, it's a really interesting board game, and has multiple factions that aren't involved in sort of the main Star Star Trek universe. Obviously, you have Federation, Klingons, and Romulans. Mm-hmm. Um. The Gorn, hegemony, is a known force. Uh, There's the Hydrants, who are basically three-armed, three-legged, three-eyed. I think they have one mouth, though. uh, Aliens who kind of operate in a um, space of, you know, being the, the British Royal Navy at times. In space. Right. Um, You've also got... uh, Depending on which version of Starfleet Universe... because The reason I mentioned the the TAS connection... Is because the Xinti are involved. Um, Right. In the games later... They would be split into the Lyrans and the Merak. Um, and that's probably a good thing because, frankly, you don't want to have to explain because in culture to people. Mm. There, there's some stuff in there. Right. So what, there, what, what, in your opinion, makes it an AU? Oh, well, it's the fact that it is explicitly, like, it's one of the things where Roddenberry addressed it during the movie era, mm-hmm. that it is an alternate universe to the Starfleet universe. The general war taking place means that it's not the Star Trek universe. It's the Starfleet universe. Uh, the ship designs are different. The weapons are different. The Kazinti being present means it's an alternate universe. The fact that late into the general war um the Interstellar Concordium show up. They are right, essentially okay. a... Imagine if the Delta Quadrant had its own federation. That's what the Interstellar Concordium are. Right, uh, in yeah. fact, the ISC later inspired part of another race that became canon. The Zindi. With their multi multi race thing, yes, the Zindi were basically the interstellar Concordium. Right. 
And the ISC came in to pacify the galaxy. Um, plus, you know, the fact that there's a general war on that even the Organians can't stop. Mm -hmm. Absolutely splits it apart. Um, and then one of the things that makes it great to me is that, well, obviously, if you were a computer gamer in, let's say, the mid-90s to early 2000s, you probably heard about the Starfleet Command games. Vaguely. They take place in the Starfleet universe. They have the Marak. They have the Lyrans. They have the Hydrant. They also, in the second game, brought in the sub-factions of the Orions. Right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because it's not just... Because the Orion pirates are not just one faction. They're broken no. up into a number of small, quasi-legal organizations that operate in different spaces depending on the empire and and where they were um the orions are federation in romulan space um the wildfire compact is federation in klingon space um there's a disgraced house that are technically pirates who operate in klingon space okay and, um, um it's it's really great and in fact there's one of the orion that uses um space beasts space monsters like space amoebas and so on as you know captured ship potential <laughs> right okay um it's definitely i'm definitely seeing how it's an alternative universe now because yeah. that that would not happen <laughs> Exactly. In Star Trek, you know? Exactly. Um, well, yeah. the fact that literally if a Klingon and a Federation ship meet, there's a fight about to happen. Um, the other thing is the the Prime teams. Um, because this is before Star Trek went hard into the we have no currency thing, Yeah. Um, there is a pay system, but the Prime teams basically were groups of Starfleet officers who got hazard pay to move between ships and the Marines, in essence, along with other troubles, you know, troubleshooters, problem solvers, etc. Um, you know, one day you could be doing SCE-related things, one day you could be a Marine. Right, um, okay. That's a, and, that's a definitely interesting concept because I don't think I've seen that in in any of any of Trek. You know, out of all the seasons that we've had, I I don't think I've seen that type of concept before. You really won't, unfortunately, because the only time it's ever been adapted outside of the Starfleet universe was into the Elite Force games, right? Because the Alpha teams from Elite Force are just the prime teams. Right. And, in fact, there was interplay where... Uh, n not the developer. Interplay between yeah. the Prime Directive RPG and the Starfleet Battles board game where your prime team could be built as characters to take roles on a ship and give bonuses to that ship. Right, okay. Um, there's there's also um, Federation and Empire where you play out the general. You have a fleet on a hex grid and you move it around and encounter various events and spread the territory of your chosen empire. Right. It's, as I said, it's a much more violent version. Yeah, it it, it definitely sounds like it's something yeah. that you need to wrap your head around. Well, if, if you're into wargaming at all, um, Starfleet Battles is a good 
fun sort of vehicle war game. Right. Um, I've only just got into tabletop games. I don't know if you've seen my struggles to try and play Dungeons and Dragons at all. Not yet. <laughs> There's a thread on the OF Discord. Go and check it out. It's basically Estuary Plays or Estuary Plays D and G, and it's literally my weekly update of my, my okay. struggles to get my head around it. Um, okay, I see the one in the D and I see the D and D chat. No, it's, I've, got, I've got a specific one that's selfishly for me just so that I can have some moral support. Um, yeah, you have every right to it. Um, yeah, so it's Eshtu does d and I will tag you in it now. <laughs> yes, please do. Because that sounds like fun. And it, honestly, I would love to help expand your horizon. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's definitely it's definitely interesting. I'm getting my head around. But I, think, I think we'll take one step at a time. Let me understand... <laughs> TNG first, and then I'll have to start somewhere else because people, a lot of people have suggested that, um, sort of like the start, um, Star Trek Adventures might be a good one mm-hmm. for me. Um, but I've got to get my head around yeah. how it Star works. Trek, yep, Star, Star Trek Adventures is um, the newest system of yeah. Star Trek RPG, it's Modifius's 2D20 system. It's actually fun, yeah. Um, though I don't have that much experience with it because I only played that system when it was kind of new because mm-hmm. that system was used also for their John Carter of Mars game. Right. Would you class it then maybe as the same alternate universe as this? Is the one no. that we're discussing? No. No. It is it is, Star Trek Adventures is absolutely set in the current New Trek era. Well, I mean, not always, but it is definitely set in the New Trek compatible universe. Fair enough. Um, the only game that is set in this universe, in the Starfleet universe, is Prime Directive. Um, okay. And there are three versions of it. Oh, God. Well, there's the original system, which is kind of massively complex. And I love it for that. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one is a D20 system uh, based on D&D 3.5, 3.0, whatever. And the D20 license, which would be more similar to uh, D&D 5, but honestly has a lot more in common with uh, um, D20 modern and then there's GURPS 4 which I have been told reliably by someone who plays GURPS that it is not so much a GURPS 4 game that is Star Trek it is a Star Trek game wearing the skin of GURPS 4 Mm -hmm. um it works very differently from any other GURPS game. And if you, and as someone who didn't know GURPS going in, it has colored my perceptions in a way that make it difficult for me to go into sort of the wider game. Right. Um, no, with that, with um, Starfleet Universe, you can pretty much set anything in it if you want to. Mm. If once you've learned the lore. Uh, yeah. And honestly, I think even a lot of canon Trek borrows from it later on. Like I said, uh, the Interstellar Concordium or the Zindi. Um, yeah. The Tholians and the Andromedans showing up are big plot points in Starfleet battles. Um, The Klingon ship designs are inspired by. The Romulan ship designs can be inspired by. The fact that um, Star Trek has brought in fighters, even, at times, comes from that uh, version of the universe as well. 
but it's definitely about the uh the war is the bigger yeah the bigger so do we ever find out or does it depend on how you're playing the game who wins the war oh it, it always depends on on how you're playing the game because um in general it's a skirmish game right um so it's a, it's a, it's an ever changing AU then exactly it's like, oh, like it. um if you've ever uh seen Warhammer 40k at all N no another but i have topic. i have I have it's, heard about it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, the idea is that there is an ongoing war at all times so that all factions can have a fight with all other factions. And yeah. that's kind of what what uh, Starfleet Universe does. Fair enough. That's, definitely and sounds like a good AU. It, it is. And it's, it's one of the more mature ones for Star Trek. And I absolutely think people should check it out more than... Uh, some others because it is as i said more mature it is one of the oldest that that exists yeah so moving on to the one that's been mentioned every single place that i have asked about trek alternate mm -hmm. universes it's the next generation yesterday's enterprise what are your feelings on this one well i already mentioned that they did garrett dirty in uh Captain's table. <laughs> I my feelings on it were so mixed at the time that it was amazing because I love the return of Tasha Yar. Yes. Okay. Um I'm in a lot of ways I'm glad that she had to sacrifice herself the way she did. Yes, she got a redemption. Even though it was a yeah. death, she got some type of redemption. Right. She did it, her her second death meant more than the death against Armus. Yes. Um, yeah. The fact that up until then, the only female captain we'd seen on screen was uh, Diana Muldor's character from Turnabout Intruder. Yep. To see that Garrett was very much a captain in the classic style. Yes. Um, you know. And to see the fact that they sort of almost swapped into the Starfleet universe briefly because of the war with the Klingons. Yeah. Um, and you know, the fact that even though it was a different universe. Fundamentally, the characters were still the same. Yes. That... I just, I find it such a fault provoking narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, it explores the, you know, the consequences of tra time travel, basically. You know, oh, it's, yeah. And, you know, some of the big moral dilemmas faced by the characters. You know, it, I also like that it introduces us to the Enterprise C, you know. Yeah. It's it's not a ship that we've we've seen it mentioned, but we've not known about what what actually happens. You know, it mysteriously yeah. emerges, um, altering the course of history. It's it's one of the it's one of the best episodes I actually think in Next Generation's run. Oh, agree. You know, I know they have other alternate universes in the Next Generation, but I think it's the most well developed one. You know, John Luke Picard is faced with the opportunity to restore time, and he's got to make that difficult decision. I think it kind of cements him as a lot of people's favorite captain. Oh, without a doubt, he's um... because because he has to condemn the other crew to their death. You know, right. he knows what the consequences are, and he has to do it because it doesn't just affect them; it affects the whole universe. And the fact that Garrett was right there with him, though. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the other thing, that that Garrett was right there with him, and there was no question, but that she was saying, it sucks, but we absolutely do need to go back. 
the needs the needs of the many. Was it the? Yep, the needs yeah, of the many know, outweigh the needs of the few. <laughs> yeah. or, I couldn't quite remember yeah. it, but yeah, that's exactly what it what it brings up. Yep. And a hundred percent, they did her dirty because she could have been such an amazing character. Oh yeah, but oh, if you if you've ever read, um, if you ever get a chance, go read the uh the lost ser- the lost era novels yeah but i also yeah. think if that was a season that had been done now there would have been more there would have been you know those one shot episodes not the one shot episodes the um the, you know, the extra track. the short tracks there would have been comics there would have been you know there would have been a lot more around it i believe she did get a comic Okay. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think she did get a comic. Um, I know that she's shown up in other things, but the biggest thing to me is, yeah, absolutely the the Lost Era novels, and there are actually a couple of other sort of Enterprise C focus pieces of the fiction. Yeah. Um so yeah, if, if you're if you're interested in that, definitely yeah. go see those novels out. I will. I just I just think yesterday's Enterprise is just such a captivating episode. You know, there's oh, an emotion there's an emotional layer to it that we don't often see in the next generation. A lot of the episodes I find aren't as thought provoking but this mm-hmm. one stands out to me as an amazing alternate universe but not just in track throughout like all of ones and even the ones that i've got for next episode um i just think wow wow so cool. what they did in that episode and it was only one episode that's that's yeah. what i think is mind-boggling it was one episode and they did so much with it Oh yeah, absolutely, and they did they did such an amazing job too, which is the bigger thing. Yeah, because honestly, they they could have screwed it up very easily. Yeah. It could have oh, gotten God. very screwed up. You know, they could have bringing Tasha Yar back could have you know it could have gone badly. You know, people yeah. could have reacted to, to it very differently, and but it was good. Tasha you know, was. Because Tasha had been such an important part of the first season, yeah. And I wish, and, and the problem is that she she deserved better than she got. Yeah. And, oh, definitely. And the problem is that I'm going to also say that that's in part. Um. Oh, what's her name? The, the actress's fault. Yes. Because no, I, yeah. You know. Because um, Denise Crosby had wanted to go into movies. And unfortunately, she said, oh, I don't need Star Trek anymore. I'm going to go do movies. Yeah. And what I've always thought is kind of a... um, I don't know if this is sort of a touching moment or sort of just irony. When Hollywood burned her and didn't help her achieve her dream, when the people that she had, you know, thrown a fit at and been difficult to, when she had everything go wrong, she came back to Trek. Yeah. And I'm not going to say there wasn't judgment. No. I'm not going to say there wasn't some, uh-huh, and when are you going away again? Yeah. Right? Uh, but at the same time, she was welcome. It was. Yeah. And I think the know. fans appreciated that she actually, as we said, she got a better death. Her death this time wasn't wasted. 
it wasn't I don't know it wasn't quick but we kind of got a chance to say goodbye that's actually the bigger thing is rather than it being the abrupt you know oh my god a, a regular character on Star Trek was just killed on screen for no reason uh, you know, rather than that, it actually was a death that had meaning. It was it was a good death. Yeah. It was a death where you can say, yes, that's um you know, that that's deserved. It's kinda of like um another death in Star Trek. Um Joan Collins as Edith Keeler in the city on the edge of forever. Yeah. Um, I remember actually hearing about an interview when she was getting on in years mm. and, you know, not doing well health wise. Yeah. And they asked her, you know, and, and somebody said to her, aren't you Joan Collins who played all of these slutty characters and named a bunch of them? And she just came back with. I'm Joan Collins, who played Edith Keeler on Star Trek. And it's, again, is it a death that is senseless? Is it a death that, you know, happens? Yes. But at the same time, it's a death that has meaning. You know, we didn't have somebody saying Tasha Yar must die to yeah. us, like with Edith. But at the same time, I don't think we needed to. I think it was kind of when it happened, it was a shock, but it also sort of told us that once in a while we can lose people and it's not yeah. just and, and they made it mean things retroactive mm. you know would measure of a man have been as impactful an episode if uh if tasha was still there probably not all right and would you know it, and, and a bunch of others, but you know the, the big one to me is definitely Measure of a Man. Because, you know, think about you it. Know, just it is Enterprise, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 a good one, and I think it's an AU that stood the test of times that we still think about now, because obviously we're here discussing it. Yep. So... I've got Absolutely. another one for you. Go for it. The Kelber timeline. The most controversial AU in Star Trek history. What are your feels on it? I. The Kelvin timeline. Oh. Yeah. Right. Kelvin universe. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start with. I have not seen the third movie. That's okay. I my opinions on those movies have honestly if anything they have warmed slightly over the years mm -hmm. because they just because I've come to accept it's a thing, it happened, let's move on. Yeah. Trek is bigger than this. Yeah, And I'm reminded of a quote from Leonard Nimoy where he was getting very annoyed at, you know, the people who were talking about canon and so on. Oh, yes. And he said, Star Trek is an adventure at its heart. And we shouldn't seek to keep it trapped within this boundary of canon we should instead seek to say where is star trek taking me today 
And I have come to accept that. Yeah. Um, I am not a fan of a lot of the stuff that Kelvin Verse did because it made it too generic in too many ways. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of some of the decisions they made about the ships, about the designs, about the villain's storyline. Even. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not a fan of it. I <laughs> I respect that they've made that they made some decisions. Yeah. And I respect that some of those decisions aren't horrible. Yeah. But. In general, no, it's not my... It's not yours. Okay, so for anyone who doesn't know about the Kelvin universe, the Kelvin universe takes its name from the USS Kelvin. Um, it's a starship that plays a pivotal role in the creation of this alternative timeline. Um, so following a temporal incursion caused by the villain Nero, the timeline is altered, resulting in changes to familiar characters and their kind of storylines. So it's it's basically a spin on the original series. So it, it alters sort of yeah, Spock, Kirk, <laughs> McCoy. Um, it, it, it changes the core, it changes the core characters. Um, obviously their lives change, different relationships, um, different, different choices, um, things like that. But what I like about it is yes, it's not going to appeal to everyone. But it brought in a lot of new fans. You know, it was a fresh take on our mythology of Trek. Um, and I quite liked the blended elements of the modern and the old. Um, and it was very action orientated, which I think any Trek since then has kind of been. Um, and the fact it kind of did give, give way to, you know, Star Trek and then it gave way in 2013 to Into Darkness and then 2016 The Beyond which I know you haven't seen but I would I would recommend going to look at it because it does give some of the best storylines I know it's it's sparked debates about canical status and you know the departure but I think it was needed I think it, I think we needed that kind of kickstart in the storytelling process again. And I think we needed it on the big screen. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I think it's, I, I think, think it's different. Oh, it, it's, it's different. All right. That's, that's an easy way to put it. Yeah. I like it, but I know that it's, it's crunch. It's controversial. <laughs> shall we say? Yeah. yeah. Um, have a quick look so there are a couple of other ones before i want to talk about the big one mm -hmm. so we've got the myriad universe series have you ever heard of that one name rings a bell okay so it's a book series that delves into various parallel universes um alternative timelines within the trek oh. universe so each book presents a different alternate reality showcasing sort of different events and different Ooh, characters yeah. mm -hmm. i quite like it because it's though it's not the same universe each time it does give us different spins on on different characters mm -hmm. um let me see if i can yeah. oh yeah I, I yes this is one of the ones yes yeah you know yep yeah, this is the one that had the last generation in it as a comic uh, yes right and i remember reading those yeah. um yes it's one of i i vaguely picked them up i was kind of because of things that because of the decisions that cbs had made or cbs yeah. had made, not being, that cbs had made by that point i had sort of um 
away from some of the uh, comics by that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember it. See, I quite like them because it gave us Christopher Pike before we had Pike in Strange New Worlds. It kind of gave us, um, you know, Julian Bashir is basically he's he's on he's on a different starship. We've got who else have we got on them? We've got like cards. We've got Kira. Yep. So we had we've had we've got a universe where Spock died at birth. Um. So there was an Andorian officer mm-hmm. that was named Kirk's XO. His name was Felon. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we've... That one is based on an episode of the animated series uh, mm-hmm. yesteryear. Yes. Um, we've got Kira Norris as a terrorist where Bajor was never liberated. I mean, even once it was, was she really not, a, was she not really a terrorist? <laughs> Well, some people could say that, but obviously, it's a got, it's a book called A Gutted World. Um, so basically, a, the war war has engulfed half the universe, but it's mm-hmm. the Romulans and Klingons fighting each other, and the Federation is being pulled into the conflict. Um, yeah. And then you've got Brave New World, which is Song's dream has been realised. Androids are now woven into the fabric of the Federation. Yep. So that's a, that's a good one. Um, let's have a look. What's the last one? Shattered Light. I quite like this one. Okay. So you've yeah. got um, you've got Riker who is defeated the Borg and destroyed the Pard. Yeah. So the Riker is now the captain of the Enterprise. Um, but they've obviously got the crisis from the Cardassians. Um, uh, they've got the return of Song. Yeah. Um, and how Data's daughter, Lau, could be the undoing of everyone, which I think is such a good concept. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got the Tears of the Eridians. Um, it's about Sulu. Yeah. Um, and it's called, instead of it being the Federation, it's called the Interstellar Guard. Which is quite a yep. good one. Um, it's sent on a rescue mission to an observation team on a primitive desert planet. The world has many names, one of them being Vulcan, and it's a primitive planet. Um, <laughs> so the team's taken hostage. Um, so I think that's it's such a good one because it kind of gives us a spin on what would have happened if the Vulcans hadn't come to Earth. Yeah. Which I think is such an interesting concept that isn't overly explored much in Trek. Um, I mean, it, it tends to be more what happens if Zephram Cochran was a jerk. Yeah. But yeah. Um, no, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's a very good concept, and the fact that the Vulcans aren't as what's the word they're not as it's they're basically they're they're still primitive it's it's right. a different it's a different spin you know it's humans being the people that make first contact to the Balkans mm. which which is definitely it's it's definitely an interesting one and then there's another one in the series it's called honor in the night so it's um Barris has died so he's the federation planet um, and after losing Sherman's planet to the to the Klingons, thanks to poison, the Agriculture Undersecretary um, parlayed that defeat into years of political bar- uh, battles with the Empire. Um, and eventually the Federation's highest office. Now the Federation News Service wants the story of its life, a quest that digs up many secrets, including, what, including the why his final words were, on Darwin. That's an interesting uh, one. I might I might have to look out that one. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go look that one up. Yeah. Yeah, that one looks like it could be it could be a very interesting one. Um but it's not one that it's not ones that I'd seen before or I've i I've been able to find in books. 
I'm... Um, but I thought they were quite interesting ones that they're different spins on, you know, Star Trek. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah, go look them up. And just also minor plug here as an ex-librarian. Um, I know that at least here in the States, most public libraries have a lot of the Star Trek novels or have access to them. Uh, use your public library. Definitely. Definitely yeah. use your public libraries. We use them. We use them over here. It's part of our routine um, every other week to go to the library. To, we don't get Star Trek books, <laughs> but we oh, do. Them. It's just not what my daughter likes. So, <laughs> ah. um, so we, we go there for the tiny human. Um, she goes to the public libraries. But yeah, hey. Star Trek books are very handy to find at public libraries. Yes, and honestly, even if you're mostly going there for the tiny one. If you pick up something for yourself, that helps set the tone for her as well. Yes. And that's I the thing. I do try, but it's, with dodgy eyes, it's not so easy to read. Oh, yeah. Oh, believe me, yeah. I know that. <laughs> um, well, the, the problem is that there are... I've actually, I had actually, back in the day, reached out to Simon & Schuster about trying to get more audiobooks created. Yes. Yeah. The problem is, and what the one person, I literally went into New York City and talked to somebody about it. The problem is that that technically could have uh, infringed on the radio play rights that they didn't have. Because yeah. of the way, and this is honestly, because CBS reacted so very strongly to the Starfleet universe. They split the rights whenever they do it, and they are very specific about what you can and can't do. Um, yeah. And especially during, you know, nowadays that, that Viacom is all back together, um, when they had split CBS and Paramount into their own companies and then created Viacom out of them, um, that was one thing, but, uh, since then, you know, since CBS is now all back together and Star Trek is now all with CBS again, um, that might change over time, but I doubt we'll see a return to the old novels as audiobooks. Yeah, it's an unfortunate thing. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see if we can get new stories. So yeah, that's it. The, yeah. And that's, the time has come. We now need to discuss the mirror universe. Oh boy. There's the elephant in the room. <laughs> okay. See, I know. I know that you don't like this. So I've left it to last. So I can just talk. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not that I don't like it. It's, well, talk. Go ahead. Okay. So. The mirror universe is such an intriguing concept that was introduced in the next, um, the original series. Um, I just think because it's got such a history, it's so good. You know, the mirror universe is steeped, it's steeped in deception, power struggles, you know, moral issues. I just think it's so thought provoking comparing it to what we see with Starfleet, you know, the Federation, it just brings out such a thought-provoking exploration of the darker aspects of humanity and the consequences of unchecked ambition. And I love the stories that we have. I really, really love the stories that we get from the Mirror Universe. And I think it's also why it played such an important role in SS Mary Rose because mm -hmm. it was going to be a long standing plot though it is still a long standing plot it kind of had to it kind of had to deviate because discovery stole my plot <laughs> and they stole they stole my plots that I've been working towards for three years with Lorca oh, Greg I know 
Gregnall was going to be the Mirror Universe counterpart, but that's neither here than there. I've forgiven them. I've got an awesome, I've got awesome plots out of it. But I just think the Mirror Universe, the concept that it is, has been so brilliant. You know, we've seen it in the original series. We've seen it in DS9. You know, we've seen it in so many of the books. We saw that fantastic episode in Enterprise, Into the Mirror Darkly, where they redid the intro to show how, uh, what's his name, Cotron, pulling yeah. a shotgun remains, you know, he pulled a shotgun instead of a handshake. It remains one of my favourite adjustments um, to an intro, and it really sets the tone in an amazing oh. way because it's such a stark contrast to Enterprise's normal theme. Yes. You know, it's it's just amazing. And I can remember watching it on Channel 4 when it first came out, and I was like, oh, my God, what have they done? <laughs> Where yeah. is this going to end up? Um, you know, and the episode was brutal. It was, it, it, it showed what the Terran Empire could be. And the fact that they ended it with Sato becoming the Empress of the Terran universe. When every other version we have seen it being male dominated and the fact that we kind of roll back to it being female led from the start i just think was fantastic and the fact that they hinted to so many different things from the original series in it you know they had archer in kirk's you know green wraparound yeah. uniform oh yeah and, just, and they did have the defiant and yes. therefore referenced the tholian web and yeah. Potentially made the Tholians into sort of the arbiter of which universe things end up in. Yes. Um, but I mean, my problem is that with the mirror universe, mm -hmm. I like mirror mirror. Yes. I'm not a fan of the DS9 version. I have to agree with you there because I don't like how they changed the, the universe to humans not being in, like basically not ruling it. I think that was very poor, a poor the, decision from them. The actually, I don't mind that part. I actually think it makes sense in a lot of ways. Um, because I do like the idea that um mirror spock tried to fix things you know the hope at the end of the episode was that yeah. mirror spock would make things better um i do like that but at the same time i what i don't like about it is that um kira's basically wearing bondage gear in that episode <laughs> You know? Yeah, it's it definitely it it, it definitely shows the nineties for what it was. Um, yes, it's definitely it, it, it's definitely it, it, a Berman special. Oh God, yes that that and, and the problem is that the Enterprise version kind of continued that, where Mirror Mirror definitely was about, as you said, the the deception, the um, distrust. Element. Yeah. The DS9 and Enterprise versions were, they, they weren't quite the thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, they were trying to be edgy and cool and, you know, and, and it just didn't work because that's not what star trek is that's you know while yes at times you do have to in the immortal words of Nimoy, sit back and ask where is star trek taking me today yeah at the same time you sometimes also need to say that's not 
where Star Trek should be. Yeah. While because... I can agree on the DS9, because I'm not a fan of it, because I think they took it very far from the original series, um, I can't agree on the Enterprise one. Purely, but that's me, because I think that two-part episode was the bee's knees. Um, oh, um, I understand I only watched Enterprise occasionally. Okay. I watched the Broken Bow. I watched, um, let's see, I, I saw the episode that confirmed that the timeline had been split and the first contact had created a new timeline. Mm -hmm. Because Enterprise does not take place in the same timeline as um, Next Generation, the first two seasons of DS9, and the first season of Voyager. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, seeing that it had changed the timeline. Um, and then the two Mirror Universe episodes, and then my favorite episode of Enterprise. These are the Voyage. Oh, well, you just want it to be controversial tonight, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe, but it's the truth. I've got a lot of feels on that episode. I've got, I've got a lot of feels, but that maybe could be another episode, another a podcast that we can do. We could oh, do yeah. one on. We could do one on that. Um, yeah, our track hot takes. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that the Mirror Universe has got better each time we've seen it. Apart from DS9, we don't talk about that one anymore. Um, I just think Enterprise was good, but mm -hmm. I think it was even better in Discovery. Um, I, I never, I never watched yeah. Discovery because yes. um, I only ever watched the one that was actually broadcast, the one episode. Okay. Um, well, no, they they put it across Channel Four. I watched it. Okay, if they yeah. Kept airing it, I would have kept watching it. Yeah. I'm not paying them to watch it because yes. I am another one of those things that's going to go into the Star Trek top, hot takes episode. Uh Star Trek would not be where it is if it had been cable in the '60s. Yes, very much, very so very much. We can. We can get into that one though. Yes, we could, we could do another episode. But, but um, Discovery in the Mirror Universe in Discovery is genius. How they I use that concept, that. it is amazing. So you have. I love Michelle Yeoh. So yes. everything I've heard about what she's doing. Oh my god! I love it. But um, you know, so so understand that I that I start from the position of I love Michelle Yeoh. Yes. No, no, no. That 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 is a good position to start from. She <laughs> is absolutely fantastic in it. She as yeah. the Empress, oh my god, she uh, has that ruthless streak. Good. She literally good. commands the room. And nice. that moment that you meet her as the Empress is absolutely all inspiring awesome. she gets this she gets this amazing title let me get see if i can find what the title is um empress oh i'm sure it's a massive one. Oh, it's brilliant i have to do, i have to read it out because it, it just makes me it makes me just happy every time mm. <sighs> it's okay i can make it all this <laughs> Let's have a look. Let's find. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh. Oh, God, where is it? Okay. So her titles are basically. She comes in and. It, how she's introduced is all hell, her most imperial majesty, mother of the Favaland, overlord of Vulcan, Dominius of Kronos, Regina Andor, 
all hell, Philippa, Greg, Gregoria, Augustus, um, and then loads of other Roman sort of titles, but it's just epic. Okay. So she comes in, she has all the lords and ladies of the Terran Empire in this room, and within five minutes of that scene, she has killed every single one apart from one. And she's Damn. turned around to that person. She's turned around to that person and said, if you repeat anything from this room, you'll lose your head as well. She literally killed all the lords and ladies of the Terran Empire because Michael has revealed that they are from the other universe and that they are there because something's happened. It's just, she is such a fantastic character. And I'm so happy that we get one more episode or feature film with her. Because she is the best part of the Mirror Universe. Honestly, she's probably the best part of Discovery. Because that whole thing with, oh, she's Spock's sister. Wah, wah, wah. No, no. That's that, another that one take. Was, <laughs> that was one where I was just like, nope, 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 nope. Don't need to deal with that. <laughs> I just think it's such an, a thrilling, thought-provoking journey. And it's done, yeah. it's created so much canon. It's created so much, it's like created comics. It's created, you know, how many stories have we done on our ships with the Mirror Universe? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think it's such a telling story that if it's still being used now, and the oh. fact that, Discovery brought it back as their first big story. Um, I just think it's epic. I just, I'm sat here grinning like an idiot, but I think it's, yeah. it highlights the consequences of things being unchecked, you know, corruption of power, and it blurs the lines between good and bad. Um, and it's got such a rich history. Um, with like complex characters and the fact that you know you've got things like Sato you know she's she's such a big character in that universe where in this universe I don't always see her as you know a big character in Enterprise well in that universe she became the empress of the Terran Empire but they also made clones of her so that they could just bring out a clone when they thought that Things were going bad. Um, yeah, I just think it's 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 such a captivating aspect of the Star Trek franchise. You know, it's it invites each of us to kind of question our own choices and re reflect on you know the darker aspects of humanity. Absolutely, I mean that's that is. The one thing that keeps the mirror universe viable and, and any alternate universe is being able to look at it not just from the perspective that we've be, been accustomed to. Yeah. But it's it's it it's the through line for uh the Starfleet universe, the the year of hell, um the Q continuum novels, the yes. Shadow universe, uh you know. No matter what, the through line is that when we take away the familiar, mm -hmm. what comes after is human nature. And yeah. What what is left is human nature. Yeah. That's the big through line for me. Yeah. And with Star Trek, because it is a series that is about hope. Mm -hmm. Because it is a series that is about growing and learning and being the best we can possibly be in the scenarios we find ourselves. Yeah. That's part of what makes these sort of alternate takes so important. Very much. And I think I think the very important aspects of any type of storytelling is the potential mm -hmm. of what if, you know, what if we didn't take that route? What if we took another route? Um, you know, those type of things. And I, I'm very excited to see what next week 
episode brings when we explore other um, alternate universes that aren't just Trek. I think okay. it's going to be very different, and we're all going to have our top fives. So I think it will be be interesting. I'm 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 intrigued about my choices. I still got to finalize them. Okay, I've got a couple in mind as well. Yes, I've got to finalize I mine. I do look forward to next week's episode, and I look forward to honestly what others will bring to the table. Yeah, because. Definitely. There are so many uh, options at this point yes. that you can bring. Yes. And, you know, going outside of track as well, you can do that. Yes. There's, this, there's a whole lot of potential. I've already yeah. seen, I've seen hints of what, what's to come and I'm excited. But I think we'll leave that episode there tonight. And thank Absolutely. you for coming along. Thank you.